I've been watching a lot of movies. I'm supposed to be on vacation now, you know. <laughs> what an interesting concept. I always look forward to going back to work so I can take it easy. <laughs> I watched an uh, entertaining death film last night. Uh, wasn't a lot of blood, you know, not lots of bodies blowing up and stuff like that, but it was, uh, for all I know, it was a film made from a game. You know how they're doing that now? They have all these different games that are played, and then they decide they need to have a film to go along with it since it's so popular. And um, the hero of the film is a woman ninja. Oh, yeah, yeah, who can kill at a glance. And her teacher sends her away um, because she hasn't quite mastered what the teaching is. And I find it more and more interesting because uh, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, Zen started to come into the pop culture. And of course, the beatniks loved Zen. They had no idea what it was, but they loved it because it sounded just like what they were doing. And so, you know, you can go to any bookstore and buy a book on the Zen of cooking, the Zen of eating, the Zen of driving, the Zen of gardening. and. Um, I think it's great because somebody's making a living writing these books, you know, about the Zen of this and the Zen of that. And so I, I saw the ultimate thing last night. We have the super bad, evil martial arts teacher. Okay? And his name was, you ready for this, Sandy? Master Roshi. <laughs> and I thought... Yes, now, now we have totally corrupted everything to do with Japanese Buddhism. And to make it worse, he had a, a very large set of Buddhist beads over his shoulder. And uh, he would play with these beads as he's talking to his henchmen who were going to go out and kill the heroine and other people. And... Uh, there's a scene early on where the heroine uh, displeases her teacher, who is my kind of real teacher, you know, because he's got white hair. And uh, he's blind, so I got to relive, you know, uh, Chui Kang Kane. What was that show? Chui Kang Kung Fu. Kung Fu, yeah, I got to relive that. Always loved his blind teacher. You know, with the big white cataracts. And the teacher said to the student, Well, you are you attached to too, too much to the things you like and you're attached too much to the things you dislike, and you have to let, learn to let go of them. So I'm kicking you out. And she says, But where will I go? Turns out she's an orphan, you know. It's one of those movies where we fill the time with flashbacks and we see all the demons she carries and her parents die and there's awful guys and all of that. And her teacher essentially says, not my problem. And so she asks him, is it a test? And he says, no. It's not a test. Go away. You have to learn how to let go of the things you like and let go of the things you dislike. Then we fast forward an hour and a half, and she's back with her teacher, and she's only killed 40 or 50 people by this time. <laughs> but she has regained her humanity, and she looks at her teacher. I won't tell you the whole story because it was, it was pretty entertaining. I don't like those movies with chainsaws where stuff goes flying everywhere, you know. This was just, we'll stab a few people, we'll kick somebody a lot of times, you know, one of those. And, uh, you know, she looks at her teacher and she says, so it was a test. And he says, well, some things can only be learned by living them. So the philosophy of this movie can be summed up in 
two statements. You have to let go of what you like and dislike, and some things can only be learned by living them. And I thought that was pretty good because that's shorter than the typical colon and a Peter Popper Press book that people sit around and smile over over coffee and croissants. And then all the stuff in between, we're just going to ignore it, all the death and dying and all this kind of stuff and how it didn't bother her to kill people right and left. The most difficult thing for people when they come into the interview room during a retreat is when I tell them to let go of things. Because that's what it's all about. Matter of fact, that's all it's about. And so the process of doing meditation is learning how to let go of things. And this is why it becomes so very difficult to practice Zen without doing meditation. Even though the word Zen means meditation, and that's obvious, you can practice all kinds of meditation and not let go of things. You can practice the great meditation of sleeping, where people feel completely revitalized after an hour. There's a good reason for that. I feel good after my afternoon nap, too, because you get revitalized. You can practice the meditation of feeling good, which attracts many ex-drug addicts to the practice of Zen meditation, because you can reach a point where you feel very, very good. You can practice the meditation of struggle, which is touted in some Zen schools as being a very good meditation to do because you go in with a problem, our famous koan, and you struggle with it and you grit your teeth. I have this horrible film that I'm trying to find an enemy to give to that shows an old Japanese man sitting in a zendo. And you can see the chips of his teeth flying because he's in there like that. You can hear the teeth grinding as he's working through his Zen problem. And the commentator, this thing was made in Canada. I still don't understand why it was made, but this film was made in Canada, and the commentator talks about how the true Zen practitioner, you know, puts all this energy and sweats rolling down him, which is okay. Sweat rolling down is okay. I don't have a problem with that. Gritting teeth and Snarling, I have a little bit of problem with as he works through his koan. Because the process is very simple. The process is letting go. Now, it's simple to say, just like it's simple to say doing meditation. I can remember years and years and years ago, a friend of my grandmother's, who uh, wasn't real happy that I'd become a Buddhist monk, said, so what is it you do there? I said, well, you know, we sit for half an hour, 40 minutes, an hour, and we meditate. So I can do that. And by golly, he could. He used to come out in the living room, lay down in the couch, turn on a sporting event, and he wouldn't move for hours. Occasionally, he'd reach over and get one of those peppermint mints. He liked those. And he'd suck on his peppermint mint, and he'd watch the sporting event. We had a monk that came up here for a few years that I never could figure out what was going on until the Venerable Puja said to me, you know he's eating candy during meditation, don't you? And I said, what? And he says, yeah, that's what that noise is about. <laughs> you know, his mouth would get dry, so he'd reach in his robe and he'd take the little cellophane off of peppermint and he'd put it in his mouth and his mouth would be wet. Well, you know that instruction that I almost gave today on how to do meditation? There isn't anything about it that doesn't have a purpose. When you put your tongue at the roof of your mouth, lightly making contact with the back of your teeth, that causes something to happen. It causes you to stop salivating. It blocks the air passage, but come on, you don't need a plug in your throat to breathe through your nose it actually stops the process of salivating. This is pretty good because it means you don't have to go <clears throat> sitting in a zendo with someone who keeps going <clears throat> swallowing. Of course, everything is magnified because it's so quiet. It's just one of those little distractions you have. 
Do you know why we don't sit wide-eyed staring? Why our eyes are halfway closed or a little bit more? We don't have to blink. Because if we bring our eyes down to about half-mast, eyelids down to about half-mast or a little bit more, then that saline solution that our body produces keeps our eyes moist. We don't have to blink. There isn't a single solitary thing about meditation that isn't planned. And yet for years people come in, well, why do I have to do this? Well, why do I have to do that? Well, I'm not Asian. I mean, I had a super long amount of time that I actually thought that Asian could sit on the floor with their legs crossed and not be uncomfortable until I was around a lot of Asians and found out they're just as uncomfortable as everybody else at least with long periods of sitting. So why do we sit on the floor? Because it's much, much easier to keep our back straight. Why do I dislike chairs? Because the first thing people do is slide into the back of them. They want to support their back improperly. So they sit in a chair. They sit in the chair properly, but few chairs have ever been designed that really support your back because it throws you back, throws your spine out of alignment, throws you out of balance, doesn't allow you to completely relax. So how do we let go? Well, the first thing we have to do is we have to let go of these ideas that we have. And practice is continuous and constant. If you really want to be the Zen practitioner, you can practice it every moment of your life because you're riddled with all of these ideas you have. I like all of that, but I don't like that. Well, get rid of the attachment to the stuff you like, get rid of the attachment to the stuff you don't like. So if you're doing something and you like it, it'll be a pleasant experience, but you can get rid of your attachment to that. How do you do that? By not trying to control it. Now I've got a little problem because our heroine, there was a second heroine in the movie, Okay. Second heroine's 13 years old and can kill just as good as the big heroine. And they both have compulsive, what did they call it? I went, huh? Compulsive behavior disorder, CBD. She says, you've got CBD, don't you? And I'm going, what? I don't remember that in any of my Zen manuals and books. CBD, compul- yeah, count things arrange things. We get a little scene where she goes in and unpacks a bag with her toothbrush and her toothpaste and her this and her that, and she has it all laid out. This is to tell us that she's compulsive. Then she goes in and she arranges her meals, an apple, an orange, and a banana, an apple, an orange, and a banana, all nicely arranged. Of course, this is to teach us that she has a lot of attachment to things like that. I tried to teach someone a few weeks ago about that, who had this compulsive. Obsessive compulsive O C O C D, yeah. Because he was having a a housewarming and I got dirt on my feet and stomped them all over the floor as he was making people wipe his feet. Got a little upset. Someday you'll get over it. So, how do you do this? Well, first thing is is to try to understand what you're attached to. To try to understand what you're trying to control. Everybody does it a little bit. Some people do it a lot. This whole control issue. The great illusion. Do I need to prove to you there is no control? Just look at your body. Tell me what control you have over it. Tell me what control you think you have over it. And then come back in 10 years and tell me how that worked. You can exercise and you can diet and you can do this and you can do that and you can even go get facelifts and you can get injections and you can do all of that and you have absolutely no control over your body. You have enormous influence. 
If you go for a walk every day, you're going to be a lot healthier than if you sit on the couch and watch television. If you eat moderate amounts, you're going to feel a lot better during the day than sitting down and gorging because you're afraid you're not going to get your next meal. But you don't have any control, because the word control implies some sort of absolute thing. And there is no absolute thing, except that there is no control. So recognize some of these things. Recognize when you're trying to control things. Recognize when things are overly important to you. And when you start to rationalize, let go. It's a good spot to let go. Doing meditation, you can learn where that spot is. Because in meditation, you'll start to obsess. You'll be sitting there and you'll think of something. It doesn't really matter what it is. It really doesn't. It can be any kind of thing. You could be doing some real heavy-duty psychological stuff where you're reviewing the latest emotional hurt that you had to deal with. You could be doing some very adolescent teenage stuff where you're doing sexual fantasy. You could be doing some just normal everyday stuff where you're making a list of all the important stuff you've got to do once you get done doing this meditation, which you're doing to make yourself a better person because it's on your list and you put a little check mark next to it. And when you start doing that, that's a really good time to go back to meditating. That's a really good time to go back to what you should be doing. And I only say should because that's what you pick to do. Okay. If you're working out in the garden and what you're doing is planting bulbs or spreading manure, then that's what you're doing. And when you start to make the list and you start to do this process, go back to doing whatever it is you were doing. And if you really need to sit down and do the list, that's okay too. Get a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, sit down in a shady place on a hot day. You can even get yourself a pad and a pencil. I'm great list makers. I never do anything with them after I make them. But I can make the most incredible. I made a list a couple summers ago, 169 things I was going to do during the summer. I was already defeated. (laughs) There was no way in the world I could do 169 things. But I got out there, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that. Well, all I got done, all I did was depress myself when I got to the end of it. I thought, well... I've even gone back, sometimes I mark things off on those lists, but I do it a year or two later. I find the list and I go, well, we did that, and we did, oh, we didn't do that, and we did that, just going along. But sitting down and thinking about something with undivided attention is altogether reasonable. It's just like we got a problem, so we get together with some friends, or we get together with some family, or we get together with some colleagues, and we talk about the problem. And maybe somebody's got an idea. And if they don't have an idea, we go away, and we hit moments in in our day where maybe we stop and we think about it. And that's okay. You can be walking down the street and the problem comes up because you gave yourself that problem. How are we going to accomplish this? So you wander off into a corner, you step out onto the porch, you stop in the middle of walking someplace, and you think about the problem. It's entirely all right, because you set up that problem. But how about the one where you're trying to get some work done, and you can't get it done because you can't stop thinking about this problem? Well, now you're in conflict. How about you're trying to live your life, and you can't live your life because you keep thinking about this problem? I have some friends. I have to be very careful here because you never know who might go on the website and actually listen to this and then take offense. I had a very enlightening, I've got to stay away from being specific here, enlightening uh, encounter with them this last Friday. Uh, we went and had some dinner together. And they're leaving on a vacation. And in the span of, I don't know, an hour and a half, I was amazed at how much baggage two people could have halfway through their life. 
I mean, we're not talking baggage baggage. We're talking steamer trunks. Remember the old trunks you see in the movies, the great big old trunks that nobody carried? Those kind. These people had those, that kind of baggage. And they, if I could see looking out on the highway and seeing one steamer trunk after the other of all this baggage. And they related hurts, 20 years of hurts, 20 years of hurt feelings of being treated wrongly. They just went on and on and on. And they got hurt all over again. And of course they got angry because it wasn't fair. Ever had anything happen to you that wasn't fair? Anybody here that ever had anything that happened, never had something unfair happen to them? Well, when are you going to get over it? You're walking down the hallway in the middle of the night. Somebody left this big object on the floor. You run right into it, smash your toe, lose a toenail, break a toe. Yell and scream and hit walls and wake everybody up in the house. Now, was that fair? You probably wouldn't even use the idea of fair. You just ran into it. Somebody that you trusted wasn't trustworthy. They took what you wanted. Whether it was fame or fortune, they took what you wanted. It's a double-edged sword. Not only did you not get what you wanted, but you found out about this horrible person that wanted it at least as much as you did, who took it away from you. What a horrible person. Is it fair? No. How long do you want to carry that around? You want to get yourself a big refrigerator box? Start filling it with stuff? In another movie I saw I, it's just amazing the way the East penetrates the West. This guy, I can't even remember what the movie is. This guy is really, really unhappy. And I watch that now. You know I'm old now, Sandy. Oh. Yes. <laughs> After last week, I call it, I had a birthday. I am now old, according to the dictionary. It's great. <laughs> because now people say things to me like, you don't look old. <laughs> I love it. Well, how does it feel to be old? I don't know. Let me know when it happens. You know, you get to say things like that. I'm watching this film, and this guy's got to be all of 32 years old. And he's had everything bad happen to him that had ever happened to somebody in the world. And see, I have a way that I get that in perspective when I start thinking about that. I think about little kids in Bangladesh. I think about those little countries that I can't remember the name of that used to be part of the Soviet Union where three different religions coexist and we have a hard time telling the difference between them. But they go around killing each other on a regular basis, blowing each other up, babies without legs, you know, dads without eyeballs and stuff. I mean, and then I think about this is an American who had a really rough life. His dad beat him on a regular basis. Okay, this is not good. There are countries where every dad beats their kids on a regular basis. They get a stick, go out every morning, beat on the kid, and say, okay, that's for anything you do for the rest of the day. So, yeah, compared to the nice, easy, protected life we have today, this kid's got a lot of baggage to carry around. But when is he going to get over it? And I, I throw my perception. You know, I, I get my perspective that way. I think about the kids wandering around Tibet that'll never see a university, never see a McDonald's, never see equality. Because they're Tibetan, you know, and the Chinese run Tibet now. You know, they'll never see a whole lot of things. They get all excited when they walk in and they get to drink that nasty tea that they have, you know, with rancid butter and barley and stuff all ground up in it and they just get all excited because it's warm because they had a couple sticks to warm it up with what I'm saying of course is our perspective gets skewed a little bit as our life gets better and better we expect our life to get better and better and then we run into something in the hallway in the dark and smash our toe and then we want to carry it around show it to everybody we go to friends' houses, we take off our shoes, take off our socks, 
show our black toenail to them and tell them how bad life's been to us, how rough things have been. So how do we let go of these things? The minute we start taking off our shoe, just put it back on. The minute you start getting distracted, go back to what you were doing. I sometimes think that well-fed Americans all have ADD because they're all easily distracted. I mean, you can start off at a party, everything's going good, everybody's having a great time, they've had some food, they've had a couple of beers or Coca-Cola, and the next thing you know, they're telling them about how bad their life has been. It's just a perspective issue. When's the last time you walked out your front door and smiled just because you could walk out your front door and smile? Now, this old, blind, white-haired, rather attractive-looking teacher in this movie essentially said to a student, get over yourself. I can't tell you how many students I've irritated, pissed off, and run away because I finally got tired of their nonsense and said, get over yourself. You're healthy. You're alive. you got both eyeballs and that toenail will grow back. Just let go. So how do we let go? We just keep coming back, just like in meditation. We just keep coming back. Is it easy? No. If it was easy, everybody would be happy. Things happen in life. We have no control over it. We lose people. We lose things. We lose positions. We lose power. We don't get things that we want, but a lot of times we do. A cup of hot water on a cold winter day is a lot better than a cup of cold water. Particularly if you don't have any way to heat your water and all you have is cold water to drink. We get all tied up in what should be instead of what is. And what is is right out the door and it's right inside here. So stop making new baggage. It is the quandary, the paradox of all practitioners that as they get rid of baggage, they make new baggage. They get rid of baggage, they make new baggage. A goal, if we want to have one, would be to make less baggage. The Buddha, we're told, didn't make any baggage at all. The Buddha didn't need even a shopping bag to carry his stuff around in. He let go of all of it. And in the let going of it, this miraculous thing caught, happened that we call enlightenment. And psychology has used all kinds of words to talk about what that means. And they don't even know they're talking about self-actualized, self-realized. But it's real easy to see if somebody's self-realized. Are they taking off their sock to show you their black toenail? Are they telling you how rough their life was? How badly they were treated? If not, then maybe they have something to show you. But you have to make an effort. It takes work. It takes practice. It takes practice to let go of the things that bother us. It also takes practice not to get addicted to the things we like to relax and enjoy the good things, but don't let that magical thing that happens where you've then got to have it again. I call it Disneyland. We're going to go and have a really good time until we get tired of it. Disneyland. What, look at the people walking out at Disneyland at 11 o'clock at night. A lot of them don't look happy. How long can you stay excited on a roller coaster? Not forever. And then you've got to come down, and then there's that aftermath. But the aftermath doesn't have to be bad. You could take the roller coaster ride, get all excited, get lots of adrenaline going, come down, get to the end of the ride, have a you know, $12 hot dog at Disneyland, a $4 Coca-Cola, and enjoy that, and try not to be cheap like me and be bothered because you paid $12 for a hot dog and $4 for a Coke and you're still hungry when you're done. 
and try to let go of that and look for that bag of old corn nuts when you get into the car because you're still not full and not get upset because there's Lenten dust all over it. It's practice. It's constant practice. It's practice not being angry. It's practice not holding grudges. It's practice forgiving people. It's practice being nice to yourself. It's practice letting yourself make mistakes. It's practice getting back to what you want to do. And that what you want to do may not be something you want to do. If you're cleaning the toilet and you hate cleaning toilets, then that's what you decided to do. Get back to cleaning house and just do it. And so this old white-haired teacher in a movie says, well, you've got to learn to let go of the things you like and then to let go of the things you dislike. And so now we have a white-haired blind Buddha who says exactly the same thing the Buddha did. It isn't just having a good time. It certainly isn't having a bad time. It's letting, learning to let go of all of these things so that you just are.